you have probably heard of contact tracing through your governor, through the news, as things that need to be implemented before we can go back to normal. But what is contact tracing? Let me share it with you and you're gonna be freaked out by the end of this video. Now, now what I did is I was very interested in this. So I went ahead and I got two certificates in terms of what it was to become a contact tracer. So I spent about nine hours. We're gonna wrap it up here in about 20 minutes to just give you the highlights of what contact tracing entails and how it's going to affect you. Because I guarantee you, it will affect you and your family. We talk about saving the lives and the livelihood of the American people and, and of course the life of our democracy. So in terms of saving lives, the only way we're going to have uh, rid ourselves of this as well as open up our economy uh, is evidence, science-based testing, testing, testing. Testing, tra just think of the T's, testing, tracing, treatment, and isolation then when necessary of course, with social distancing. So let's look at the main points. Now, this is if you have COVID-19. You can either be done by test or by symptoms. Now, what our contract tracers know is that you can infect two days before and up to 10 days after. And how you can infect people is there's three definitions that were given in contact tracing school. One is physical. So you're hugging someone, you are kissing them, high-fiving them. Any physical contact, you could have given it to them. If you're close, within six feet for more than 10 minutes, so you're talking to someone and you're within that six feet social distancing number, well, you could infect them then. Let's say you're more than six feet apart, but for a longer time. At this point, you're thinking movie theaters, airplanes, trains, restaurants. So maybe not direct contact with somebody, but they're in the vicinity of the area for longer than 30 to 40 minutes. Now. What's gonna happen is once you get a test that is positive, it goes to a tracer and that tracer is going to do some research on you, find out a little bit about you and give you a call. Now they're gonna tell you that you, you tested positive and that you need to be isolated for a minimum of 10 days on the onset and it has to be within three, no fever for three days. So if you're on day nine, but you still have a fever, you need to add another three days until your fever is cleared. And by isolation, I mean total isolation. This is nobody near you. Even your dog can't be there. So you can see here that specifically with a person that is symptomatic, they should maintain separation from household animals as they would any other household members and avoid direct contact with any of your pets. So you cannot contact your pets, people, anybody in your family, you need to be completely isolated. Now what that means is you could have to go into a hotel room um, if you have no way of not sharing a bathroom or any space, they will check that out. So you'll have to show like video evidence if the conference is done via teleconference, walk them around your house, let them know that you have space to be isolated. Now the next is quarantine. Quarantine means I am healthy, I have no symptoms, I have not contacted the disease, but maybe for 14 days, they're gonna check to make sure that I haven't. So that means again, that I cannot leave my house. And as a contact tracer, I'm supposed to set you up with social services. So if you have kids um, and you have no one to care for them, we'll take your kids, we'll take care of that. If you have need groceries, we'll do groceries, but you literally, cannot be in contact with anybody and you cannot leave your house, even if you're healthy. You are still quarantined not to be leaving the house. Unfortunately, you could be totally healthy, get out of quarantine, and guess what? Be at a restaurant, someone else in the vicinity has it, be quarantined again. Now, I'm not sure what happened with all the other states, but what we did in California is we passed a workman's comp law that's in effect to the end of July, that workman's comp is going to take care of all of that for any employee, no matter where you contract contact it, the uh, employers are gonna be held responsible. I'm not sure what that is in all the other states, but it's something that passed here just recently and who knows if that will get extended. Okay, so isolation and quarantine, 
basically means the same thing, except quarantine is a little bit longer, right? So you're sick, you only have 10 more days. If you're quarantined, 14 days. What does this look like in normal time? Okay, so they're gonna wanna know, as a contact tracer, um, I call you up, I tell you you've become positive. We've looked at your house, do a video conference so you can show me that you have a place to isolate. And then I'm gonna ask you, who did you come in contact with? And I'm gonna tell you, if you tell me, oh, I don't know, I'm gonna tell you to look at your phone and we can do it together and look at your social media and we'll figure out where you have been. And you need to make sure you know your movies, flight numbers, and anything with large venues. Now, some of the places, what they've already instituted now, are you have to put your contact information when you go to a restaurant, you go to a hair salon, any of those things, because that way they can track you. But you would say, I went to this movie, or I went to this restaurant. Everybody who's at that restaurant would be contacted then by the contact tracer. So let's say, unfortunately, I got it. Well, guess what? My family would have to be quarantined. And not just for the 10 days, they have to be quarantined for 14 days because it would be also the last time they had contact with me. So on day four, my test comes back positive. Now they have 14 days from day four, the last day that they had contact with me. And they have to be completely isolated from me. Let's say I was on a train. We were all sitting on the ca same cabin because I was getting to work and there was 10, 15 people on that train. All of them would need to be quarantined. I had gone to work. Everybody at work would need to be quarantined. I went to a restaurant after work. All of them would need to be quarantined. Can you see how a disease, when it is already widely spread, this doesn't make sense to quarantine the population in terms of you could get quarantined again and again and again. Even though you're healthy and never sick, you will not be allowed to leave your house. Now, you've been hearing that this is all voluntary. You'll hear it throughout the, the speeches. I've listened to a lot of governors. I'll put on the Washington governor really quickly so you can hear him say, oh yeah, it's, they, they'll follow it. But let me show you before I do that, a couple of the documents that are out there. This is right on his website. He's already rolled out the plan. And basically you can read this, request for voluntary quarantine. This is for somebody you're the legal guardian at. It tells you to go and remain at the address by the date and time. And then I love this. It is very important that you comply with this request for voluntary quarantine. Remember, I'm not sick. Nobody's sick. Your health and the health of others depend on it. If you do not comply with this request for voluntary quarantine, we may use a detention order enforced by the police to assure your compliance. Hmm. That's the strangest voluntary request I've ever received. And then this is also on the website. And I've put everything here because obviously go research this stuff yourself. But you can see here, if you use a court order because someone is not following, they have non-compliance, you can be incarcerated and fined up to $2,000 per day. Let me show you the governor. So let me show you how he's spinning it for somebody who does not follow direction. Hi, Governor. When it comes to contact tracing, how are you guys going to handle people or families who want to refuse a test or to isolate if they want to leave their home to get groceries? I know you said they can't do that. How will you make sure they don't? Well, that's why I referred to the family support personnel. We will have attached to the families a family support person who will check in with them to see what they need on a daily basis, see how they're doing, see how they're faring, and help them if, 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 they, if, if they can't get a friend to do their grocery shopping, uh, we will help get them groceries in some fashion. If they need pharmaceuticals to be picked up, we can help make sure that they get their pharmaceuticals. So that's why we want to provide them family support. As far as refusal, it just shouldn't come to that. and It really hasn't. We've had uh, really good success when we've asked people to isolate they've done so in the real high percentages. So uh, we're happy about that. And we believe that that will continue. So remember, everybody that will be quarantined will be 14 days from the last contact. And this, there's no minimum times. This could be indefinite. Now you're thinking, there's just no way. Like, what about my privacy? How do I have to share this information? And I can tell you, when I went through the contact tracing classes, they tout that you are doing this contact tracing for the, 
the greater good. You are helping people not spread the disease. It is very important that that people have privacy, but when it comes to the greater good, your privacy is null and void. Now, as soon as you get a positive test result, this goes directly to an electronic database. Let me tell you, I took this directly off the training website that the isolation or quarantine can be mandated and enforced. And there's other health enforcements such as vaccines or requirements to take medicine because you cannot be, risk being infected and giving it to others. When you're tested for COVID-19, you might assume that your test result will stay confidential with your doctor and the health department. After all, that's how it usually works with medical information, but we're living in unusual times. The Associated Press has revealed that across America, there's widespread sharing of medical information between health officials and law enforcement. Denver is doing it, so is El Paso County. It is law enforcement specific information that is only in our computer aided dispatch. Jacqueline Kirby is with the El Paso County Sheriff's Office. She says addresses are flagged identifying homes of people who have tested positive for COVID-19. We get sensitive information all the time. We have cautions on addresses for a myriad of reasons. And this is just an additional layer of protection for our deputies. I want to share with you, this is just something in California. That's where I'm located. But you can read here, and I'm assuming that a lot of other states have similar things. This shows that they can, because you can see here, a threat of a communicable disease outbreak or epidemic that threatens the public health, it gives them the rights to do this. Adopt and enforce regulations requiring strict or modified isolations or quarantine for any contagious infections or communicable diseases. It takes measures as necessary to ascern the nature of disease and prevent its spread. It can take control of the body of any living person or the corpse of any deceased. It can quarantine, isolate, inspect, and disaffect persons, animal, houses, rooms, and other property. So based on what we have right now, I don't have any privacy rights. You can see here, this is just New Jersey. I just wanted to throw this out there because other states have laws. This was enacted in 2005. So I suggest you go start researching what is allowed in your state and what rights you have given up when you start looking at a disease that could pose a risk to the health of the population. Let me put it very clearly. You have no constitutional right to endanger the public and spread a disease. Even if you disagree, you have no right not to be vaccinated. You have no right not to wear a mask. You have no right to open up your business. Wait, can I stop you? Did, yeah. No yeah, right to not to be vaccinated, meaning if they decide you have to be vaccinated, we have to be vaccinated? Absolutely. And if you refuse to be vaccinated, the state has the power to literally take you to a doctor's office and plunge a needle into your arm. If the vaccination Where is that in the Constitution? To prevent, if the vaccination is designed to prevent the spreading disease. If the vaccination is only to prevent a disease that you will get. For example, if there's a disease that will kill you, you have the right to refuse that, but you have no right to refuse to be vaccinated against a uh, contagious disease. Public health, the police power of the constitution gives the state the power to compel that. And there are cases in the United States Supreme Court. So they talked about tools available for contact tracing because they said, you know, in California, we're supposed to have 20,000 contact tracers for our population. They said, you might get a lot of these cases. So you might be doing a couple hundred, 500,000 a day. How else can we do it? And I thought this was weird, but they talk about China and North Korea. They say China and North Korea have a great system because they have a centralized database. And this database has everybody's phone number and they're given a unique code. And these codes track them through GPS. So as soon as they're in contact or somebody has it, they can send a notice out to everybody and they automatically know that they've been infected. We don't have that in the USA, so it was weird that they brought that up. However, they wanted to share was a great system. They started talking about the USA and that they have smartphone apps and also that businesses should be taking information if somebody comes effect infected at this point until apps are more widespread. I wanted to share about apps because you've heard they're voluntary, 
they're voluntary. And right now in the U.S., there's some apps out there and we'll look at those, but they're about 2% of the people have downloaded them and they said they need at least 50 to 70% of the population to download it to make apps effective. But how do these apps work? Well, let me share what they're doing in India. So India released an app and they said, this is a voluntary app. You do not need to download it. However, get this, in order to go anywhere, you have to have the app. So if you want to get on a plane, you have to show the app that you are not under quarantine or isolation. You want to get into work, you have to show your app. You want to get on a train, you have to show your app. So they said, oh, it's voluntary. They had the most downloads, more than Pokemon Go, because guess what? You couldn't go back to life without downloading the app. Now, I also put here New Zealand's app. What they do is they give you a QR code. You have to scan that QR code to get anywhere. So if you're supposed to be on quarantine or isolated, guess what? You're not getting anywhere because your app doesn't show you're cleared. So that's how they're really able to enforce this without a, a huge police or military presence because you just can't go anywhere without the app. You can't get in the grocery store because they're going to have a QR code where you need to scan in. Now, you may be thinking, well, do they even have that in the United States? Well, here's four states that already have their app ready to be downloaded. And like I said, they're at about 2% right now. Um, but you might've noticed this on your iPhone the other day. This showed a software update. And if you didn't see it, you might've already got the automatic update. But basically it says, this allows um, COVID-19 contact tracing apps to work. And you may not even have known it. It's, it was a very quick little update, but it has already come to the United States. Recently, Google and Apple just gave out some information. I thought this was great. Here's the website at the, at the bottom. Obviously, I want you to do your own research, but you can kind of see here how it works that you can see that you're close to somebody and you get a notification that, uh-oh, you need to be quarantined. You were too close. Someone had it. And then listen to this. In this second phase in the coming months, this is really interesting because it talks about that they're going to use Bluetooth in the first phase, but without requiring an app to be installed. If a match is detected, the user will be notified. And if the user has not already downloaded an official public health authority app, they will be prompted to download an official app and advise on next steps. You're not going to have a choice. They're telling you it's it's voluntary at this point, but so was social distancing. And then we got locked down in our house. So it is not voluntary. This is happening and you need to be aware. So I suggest this is a great document. Pull up this COVID-19 document that Apple and Google gave out. It really talks about all the different things that are going to happen because of the app. And it is scary just to kind of share with you the different states. If you think your state is exempt because of it might be a red state versus a blue state, every state is doing this. Okay. So I would suggest checking out this bill HR 6666. And basically there's a hundred billion dollars that they're asking for 2020 and additional years for sub subsequent fiscal year financing for 2021 and beyond. So if you think this isn't happening and you think they're not investing a lot of money in it, they are. They're trying to get $100 billion to track and trace us and keep us quarantined. How do you think they're going to allow you to get back into society without being quarantined and isolated again and again and again, especially as disease spreads or we do more testing and we realize that maybe there's a lot of people out there that have it that just don't show symptoms, but they'll need to be isolated. You'll see that there's 120 antibody tests. In general, these tests are not reliable for the individuals to act based on the results. So basically, they're saying, even if you have antibodies in the coronavirus, it's still unknown if that protects you from getting sick again. There's probably only one way that you're going to be able to get out of your house, and that's going to be to be vaccinated. So just watch out for that, because that is really becoming a hot topic of, of the vaccination. And that might be the only way that you're going to be released out of this tracking and tracing in terms of being allowed to go into stores. Um, I wanted to share this last video with you. And, and I, I thought it was interesting. Um, I'll put it that way and, and end with that video. But start thinking about this tracking and tracing and really, what's the purpose? It makes sense if something was small and the outbreak was small, 
and they could actually track and trace it. But at this point, it's so widespread. What is the value? With that, Jack Windsor, WMFD TV, Mansfield. Uh, Governor, I'm the last question, and uh, my question is for you. And it's going to be a very sensitive question, and I'm going to do my best to be intentional so that it's not misrepresented. Uh, today, it sounds as, as if we're pivoting from COVID to larger social issues like housing, education, and transportation. Uh, I know in past pressers, we've learned about Dr. Paul Farmer and Partners in Health working with us on contact tracing. Uh, looking at the Partners in Health website, contact tracing seems to be part of a larger social agenda for Partners in Health. Uh, the site states a, a vision to rectify, quote, structural violence of capitalism, which the organization sees as the root cause of things such as uh, racism, gender inequality, xenophobia, and homophobia. Now, I'm not questioning the injustice of those things, Governor, so let me be very clear about that. What my question is, can you tell us why you chose to partner with an organization that demonizes capitalism and seems to be rooted in liberation theology based on Marxist ideals. Well, I've never uh, always agreed with Paul Farmer, uh, who started it, and uh, m many of his ideas. Uh, but he, he and the organization have had an ability to deliver health services. Uh, I'm, my wife, Fran, and I are very familiar with this in Haiti. Uh, we've, we've seen what he has done in Haiti. We've visited Haiti over, over 20 times. And so that's just something that we do in our private lives. And so the partners with health, we don't, you don't have to accept the ideology uh, 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 of Paul or anybody else. But what I'm interested in is, is getting things done. And they're not the ones who are doing it on the ground. Uh, people who are going to be doing it on the ground are Ohioans. Uh, but, you know, they, they serve as a consultant. Uh, they have done this type of work, um, not only in the United States, but, but around the world. Uh, they're pretty darn good at it. And so I'm going to take help from wherever I can get help and where I find expertise. I, I don't have to agree with everyone's uh, ideology or, or what they think about uh, everything in the world and to, to, to accept that, to be able to use their help. Uh, we're in a war. We're in a battle. We're going to put the best people we can on the field. Uh, the best people are the Ohioans, but we're going to get, we're going to get some help from this group because uh, they've done some of these things before.